Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the School of Art lecture series here at the University of Arkansas. And tonight's lecture features educator and artist Derek Ham. My name is Tay Butler and I'm a second year photography MFA and visiting artist liaison. Tonight's lecture is a collaboration between the School of Art Graphic Design Department, represented here on a panel today by Diana Nadich and Allison Place, Assistant Professors of Graphic Design, and the Center for Photographers of Color, represented by Aaron Turner, Research Associate and Coordinator of the Center. The Center of Photographers of Color seeks to promote emerging and underrepresented artists of color working within photography, digital imaging, and other lens-based media. Our goal is to collaborate with artists from diverse backgrounds whose work challenges the monolithic historical narratives within culture and art. Through this collaborative approach, the Center aims to create a sustainable creative community through the commissioning, support, oral history, and archiving of original works as a public education resource to identify, to address identifying representation. Before I introduce our distinguished guests, I'll take this opportunity to inform you to direct all of your questions to the Q&A section of this webinar and leave the chat open for general reactions and comments. Now to introduce our speaker, Derek Ham, a PhD Associate Professor and Department Head of Art and Design at NC State University's College of Design. His research expertise spans the areas of game-based learning algorithmic thinking and immersive media. He completed his doctoral work in design computation from MIT, holds a master's degree in architecture from Harvard's Graduate School of Design and a Bachelor of Architecture from Hampton University. As the founder of the Mixed Reality Lab at the College of Design, he continues to investigate both virtual reality and augmented reality technology to find ways these tools can expand the possibilities of human interactions. In 2019, the NC State University also invested in the lab spin out company Logic Grip Inc. as a startup that produces VR content and develops new VR hardware and peripheral devices. In 2017, Derek was funded by Oculus by Facebook to complete a VR project called I Am a Man. The VR project centers on the civil rights, 1968 Memphis sanitation worker strike in the last days of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. This VR experience has been broadly celebrated for its achievement in the use of this new technology to communicate history in a meaningful way. The project has been featured at film festivals nationally and internationally, including the SciGraph 2018 Virtual Augmented and Mixed Reality Program. I Am A Man won the Perspectives Award for Immersive Storytelling at the 42nd Cleveland International Film Festival won VR Best of Show at the 2018 Nashville Film Festival, and was the winner of the 2018 Faust Prize for the category Bridging the Divide. His next VR project, Barnstormers, Determined to Win, is now in pre-production as a winner of the Epic Games Mega Grant Program and Pitch and Produce Program by Reillusion. Please join me in welcoming Derek Hamm. Hey, thanks so much, bro. Thank you for the introduction. Um, man, I'm excited to be here virtually with you all and really wish I could have been there in person. I was telling someone that, you know, what I truly miss about traveling is just the engagement, engagement with colleagues, engagement with um, the students and engagement with, with people human to human. And I think in a lot of ways, when we start having this con conversation about the use of technology, we have to remind ourselves that these are just tools. And I pray to God, these aren't tools that are going to replace kind of that, that familiar environment of just being in a coffee shop with someone and being able to sit across the table. Um, but nonetheless, as human beings, we appropriate tools, we make them, and we find new ways and new innovative ways to still move on. And that's what we're doing tonight, using Zoom to have this dialogue, have this conversation, and talk about um, immersive technology as a way that we've appropriate it to do different things. I'm going to share my screen now and begin to walk you through a little bit of a little bit of the work that I do um, as well as some of the projects. Let me change this one second. I'm sorry and I'll keep talking. Um, 
someone told me that I should share the screen and optimize it for the video. All right, let's do that again. So as Tay mentioned, I run what's called the Mixed Reality Lab in the College of Design. And in this space, we're doing a lot of things um, that focus on not just innovative, innovation for VR sake, we're also looking and thinking about the end consumer at the end of the day. So a lot of the projects that we take on aren't looking at the kind of um, huge medical device that is about VR or something that's some new million dollar um, piece of hardware or software. We really focus on end products that meet people and common people. And even when I start thinking about the type of VR projects that I do, I'm really drawn and feel this kind of need to tell stories that uh, communicate the stories of everyday people and oftentimes marginalized communities. And the work that I do in creating this lab, I, I have to give credit to where I did my PhD program at MIT, um, because that was the first time I was inspired to see that design was situated in a world that was outside conventional boundaries. And the computation group at MIT, even though it sits within the Department of Architecture, as you see here in their home screen, addresses a wide range of design, um, uses design rather to address a wide range of issues in society. And this is the, one of the first times where I, I saw design saying to itself, why be bound by a discipline? Why say, oh, I need to address this world problem through the lens of graphic design, or I need to address this problem through the lens of film or through the lens of, it was never about kind of narrowing your scope into a small discipline. It was saying, hey, first I'm a designer and I can make and I can create. So how can I use the tools around me, sometimes creating new tools to make the world a better place? And I think that's a charge to all of us to really think about when we go into the design profession to keep our minds open and explore new territories. And one of the territories that I discovered early on is this new wave of virtual reality. We, we know that VR has been around since um, the early 80s. And even before that, there were experiments with lenticular lenses and trying to trick our brain and our mind to have a sense of depth and space. But it, it was really this new wave that happened um, somewhere around 2011, 2012, with the release of the Oculus headset that started this new kind of VR arms race in which people were truly looking at, at virtual reality and saying it's affordable for the first time, chipsets are easier um, to reproduce mass volumes of this hardware before VR was something that you had to go into a very expensive lab and experience it on that end. And now as it becomes this affordable tool, somewhat affordable tool, how can we now use it to do different types of things? And at the end of the day, virtual reality is all about a sense of presence. It's what makes this medium completely different than others. This idea that it tricks you and positions you to be in a space at a specific time. Now, for me, history became a really interesting subject to appropriate VR to begin to explore things. One of the first projects that I did um, was the recreation of a Palladian villa. And this is when I was still a um, PhD student. Uh, we went to Northern Italy. We, we did some um, photo capturing of some of the spaces. We recreated them as models. We went into those spaces and began to see, this is what this building would have looked like in its prime and its glory. Uh, but since then, uh, just looking at the types of VR projects that were being created in the early days, and it's funny that I say early days because I'm looking at a project like this, which is what we would call an old project in VR, but this is the Apollo 11 project that was released in around 2015. Um, the idea of looking at historical moments was something that was really drawn to. And there are great projects that are out there like Apollo 11's VR experience, the Pearl Harbor VR experience by Time Magazine. And I began to kind of analyze and see, you're like, not only what does it mean to put out on a VR headset and be back in history, but more importantly, how does my aspect and viewing of this experience, who I am, my personal identity, my identity as a black man, or your identity as a woman, your identity, um, who, whatever those, those uh, itemized things that we attach to ourselves or the lenses that through we look at the world, they do come in play in how we view the world. They come in play in how we view art. They come and play in how we view history. And so I really started wrestling with this idea that 
if I were to transport someone back in history and to look at a historic moment, perhaps it's less just about bringing my identity. What if I could really change your perspective by putting you into the shoes of someone else? And I'll show you a couple of images later of how we do that. But at the core of this as an academic, I think about how, what are we actually doing when we're creating a project like this? And a lot of this does stem from the digital humanities. This idea that we do historical investigation. I'm drawn personally to lost stories and past cultures, hoping that we can bring new perspectives. There is an aspect of translation. You know, we do acknowledge that as much diligence that we actually do in trying to remodel spaces and characters and avatars, that there's still a level of translation. There's still a level of, um, of you kind of putting your, your, your fingerprint on it. And I think of it as a paleontologist. When someone goes and they find a fragment of the dinosaur bone, um, they do to their best ability uh, recreate the whole dinosaur by saying, okay, even with these bones, we can put the pieces together and translate what the rest of that dinosaur looks like. And a lot of times, digital humanity projects, and definitely the ones that I do, oftentimes are taking these fragments, interpreting them as recreated digital assets, and then putting them together to disseminate it. And traditionally, yes, we've done this with books and film, web media, and I'm really drawn now to virtual and augmented reality. So as was mentioned in the introduction, a lot of the, these ideas came together in one beautiful VR piece called I'm a Man that was sponsored by Oculus. And with this, I began, I learned a lot. And, you know, those who of us who, who work in VR, we still acknowledge we're still creating the playbook for this medium. We haven't figured it all out, but I personally learned a lot. And when I give these talks, I try to share as much as what I learned in the process of making it, and what, how much I learned in the process of seeing people go through it and be reflective. And then you'll even see a little bit in this talk, seeing how people have appropriated this and used it in magnificent ways, ways I wouldn't have even predicted. But at the end of the day, um, drawing from this idea of retelling the story of the sanitation workers strike, um, going by this mantra, I am a man that happened in Memphis years ago. And for those who aren't familiar with the project, here's a short trailer of it. Oops, play. it's not playing. I'm gonna skip over for time's sake. We'll, we'll share links of this project in the chat later on. You can look at those on your own. At the core of this is a question about how we analyze and look at pictures. You know, whenever I do one of these projects, I look directly into what photographs we have and what data we have from these spaces. In the case of this project, we have photographs. It's really eerie that um, King's photographer who was following him in Memphis at the time was right there to capture these long, these, these, these terrifying moments, um, just moments after he passed away. And when I analyze a picture and start thinking about what it might have been to, to be there at that space, sometimes if we're not careful, we begin to sensationalize these photos and almost put them in a Hollywood type of perspective of, oh, it's like, um, it's, it's, it almost becomes a pseudo fiction. We kind of, like we know these people were real, but we forget to look at a photograph and realize every single person in this photo's life was changed forever at that moment. The maid that's there at the bottom of the corner with her hand on her, her face, obviously Dr. King's closest friends and allies right there in the balcony pointing towards where they heard the gunshot. But what I want to do in a VR piece is I want to humanize this experience and bring it into reality. As one of my colleagues says, he wants to, it, it's as if we can breathe the same air as they did. And so when I begin to look at these photographs, I start fundamentally asking myself and imagining myself, what is it like to be the people in this photograph? You know, I, this is one of my favorite photographs that I look poured over in the I'm a Man project. It's one of my favorites because I'm drawn personally to um, the black soldier that's there. And you start to think about the paradox of what may have happened um, in his mind as he's looking at that. I'm hoping one of these days I give this talk that someone will be like, oh, I know who that person is. That's my grandfather, that's my uncle. Um, because I'm really interested in that one soldier there, the African-American soldier who's holding the bayonet. And think about the, the, the paradox there, right? That he feels a connection culturally to the men who are 
marching for freedom. But at the same time, he's feeling connected to his brothers there because that's his job. He's a soldier. He decided to enlist and serve his country. So you look at a picture like this and you begin to break down these kind of moments and all of a sudden, for me, they become a little bit more real. And that's a kind of a stage of empathy, this idea of really imagining what it means to be that person, what it means to be, as I look at this picture, uh, Dr. Abernathy, one of King's closest friends, sitting on the bed just hours after King was assassinated. And you look at the despair on their faces and you look at the, um, their expressions and you can imagine what it felt like to, to have these events happen right in front of your eyes. And that's what we try to do in VR, try to transport you, not just visually, but emotionally, right? Try to transport, transport you to a place in time so that you really feel the gravity of what's happening in this space. Uh, luckily for me, this project had some affordances in that even some of the spatial environments that we're trying to create here are still captured to this day. If you go down to Memphis, where the Lorraine Motel has kept the front facade and kept the classic sign and has now been gutted out and changed into a civil rights museum. Strangely enough, the museum doesn't just focus on the Lorraine Motel and the balcony where Dr. King was slain. They also have kept the apartment building where the assassin took the shot. And that's a really interesting and eerie juxtaposition there to fully capture history. We're not sugarcoating it here. We're saying Dr. King standing on this balcony across the street, this horrific thing happened and turning those spaces, those physical spaces into a deep place of reflection. And so when you walk to the museum for the first time, you do have a sense of that you're on hollowed ground or in a sacred space because the balcony is there, the physical door is there, those physical components are there geographically placed in the same space. And as I try to tell other people about this, as you go into the museum, you look at these artifacts that are there, these signs and, and other things, oftentimes museums transport the artifact to that location. If you go to the museum, um, the African American Museum in DC, you, you're gonna say that those artifacts have brought and brought to the museum. But this museum is special in that the museum itself is an artifact, that facade is an artifact. These spaces and the air are almost like artifacts because this is where history actually happened. And so I thought about these moments and you look into the room where Dr. King stayed that's still staged and preserved to this day, as if we could imagine these seconds and moments before he was slain, how can we capture this essence in a virtual environment? And a lot of the process really requires rigor. If you're going to grab something that exists still to this day, like room 306 in Lorraine Motel, then we have to do diligence as designers to make sure every single element in that space has been vetted and placed there for a reason and that we're matching to the best of our ability, a true one-to-one -one scale of what that room actually is. So that means looking at the carpet, trying to get the samples of the texture, um, analyzing the, the lamps, analyzing the phones, asking ourselves, well, what phone was that from that pho um, photograph? What phones were there in the 50s? Like everything is vetted through in a very similar fashion that you would potentially if you're working on a set design for a Hollywood picture and asking yourself, oh, we need the right cars and automobiles and all those things. Um, but it's a very intriguing process. It's almost an archival process that you then put it together that can be rendered for you to put a headset on and then be in this space. As a designer, I took it a step forward because I knew I wanted to capture this emotional aspect of the experience. So building room 306 was one of the first things I did for the project. But initially after that, um, I did experiments that never showed up in the VR experience. And one experiment for me that I did is I captured old footage of television footage, threw it on the TV in the room, and just put a VR headset on and literally watched old black and white footage in there. And then I took it a step further and put an avatar of Dr. King in the room. And what it, what it did for me is it humanized him. I started to just really think about what does this, a civil rights, uh, just a man, a dad, um, I'm a father, three young kids, I'm a husband. Um, what does it mean to just like be on the road, sitting in a hotel, watching a show, 
putting your thoughts together. I mean, this was Dr. King's life moments before he was slain. So there's something special about VR that enables you to humanize these moments and then to have a deeper level of reflection as you begin to tell the story. The other aspect that I love, as I mentioned this early, about how could we transport someone into the skin of someone else. And there are a couple of other pieces that are beginning to do this. Um, there are three pieces that stuck out to me um, that either were released right before I did I'm a Man or being released at the same time. And The Thousand Cut Journey by Dr. Courtney Cogburn, Being Homeless by uh, Dr. Bayliston at Stanford, and even Clouds of Cedra um, by Chris Milk and Gabo Aurora. These are all interesting pieces in that these are some of the first examples of what we're calling VR for empathy. All designed to change your perspective and change your ideas about what it means to be, in the case of Clouds of Cedra, um, someone in a refugee camp. In the case of being homeless, giving you the agency and the spatial sensation of what it's like to have to sell your property and eventually be evicted uh, from your apartment. And a Thousand Cut Journey, a really passionate piece that takes you through the life of um, implicit and explicit biases as a young kid going through the school system. So all these pieces are what Chris Milk would call VR becoming the ultimate empathy machine. And while I have the, the highest respect for Chris, I still think that idea of empathy machine can turn some people off because when you think of the word machine, you often think of it, it's, this is automatic, it's routine, it, it does it for you. It's like, if I'm a racist, I put on a VR experience, I'm moved and I'm no longer a racist. And everyone knows how ridiculous that sounds. It doesn't work that way. It's not a machine, it's a tool. And when I think about this notion of a tool, right? That implies that you have to do some work. You can use VR, but at the end of the day, if you're not willing to go there emotionally, if you're not willing to go there cognitively to break down what you're seeing and be reflective, it's just like any other just um, piece of technology and medium. I just suggest, and what we're, we do agree on, is that the VR does this in a way that's more powerful and has different effects than any other medium. Any other medium, whether it's photography or whether it's just the use of, um, of film, uh, documentaries, all these are great tools, but something about VR takes it a step further in that it positions you from the perspective of that person. And, and Dr. Bailison expands this even more in calling it these levels of, of empathy. And you know, there's one level that when we see something, it's like you have this gut physical reaction. And VR definitely does that. And you know, something coming your way, you have the inclination to move. Um, you see something horrible, yes, you cringe, you feel like you're there. In the second wave, you begin to say, oh, what do you think the people are feeling? Like, what caused those feelings? But I wanna push further in my work and I strive to do what Dr. Zaki calls full-fledged empathy. And this is the idea that not only do you go through those first two stages, but you take the headset off and you are now willing to go to a new stage, the stage that says, I want to do something. I want to change something. I want to change something about myself, change something about the world. And reflecting on history can definitely do this. I think that this embodied activity of VR really pushes our brains to do that. There's no escaping the black skin when you're in I Am A Man. If you think about a documentary, you can always look away. You can always see yourself spatially, the juxtaposition of I'm looking at the screen, but I'm safe in my living room or I'm safe in the theater. But when you go through I'm a man and you go through this experience, you look down into your hands, you cannot escape being in the skin of this black man. And so for the first time, you have a, for a piece of media that can transport you and give you what's called this embodied identity. And that's a very, very powerful tool that I would, I would love to discuss further about even the ethical questions about positioning someone in this type of embodied role. So in doing this, I did draw a little bit about my, my architecture background. You know, my, my first degree was in architecture at Hampton University and my master's was in architecture. And there's something about studying space that did give me the affordances of creating a VR experience. And this is what I call creating a spatial language. And for, 
for, for those that I begin to do workshops with this, I go in this in depth about this idea of having diversity in a VR experience, that there are moments when you're in an open space, moments when you're in high spaces, moments when you're in closed spaces, but all this is what I'm calling a spatial rhythm. And this is just some of the technical background, just as I was showing you the Unreal Game Engine, we have to think about some type of schema or language that makes a strong, powerful VR experience. And what we do is we take the spatial conditions you can add lighting conditions and sound conditions. We pull them together for what's called a targeted emotion. And what happens in doing this, you begin to create this language and these schemas of, hey, by putting you in this connection condition here, by doing this lighting condition here, and hopefully triggering the sound, I yield a certain outcome. And that's what we try to do. And that's what we're still trying to do in VR. I think in the future, we'll have this um, really um, mapped out perfectly in the same way film has over the years come to a conclusion when you know you want to express certain things you use a certain type of music for optimism you use a certain type of setting and you're using this sun setting that begins to have these metaphors for what we're experiencing emotionally vr is not yet, there yet but it's interesting as i talk to other developers and other artists we are starting to learn from each other and eventually we'll get to a point where we can present these as almost like a mathematical language to say this is the way to target sorrow this is the way to target to, to target triumph and we'll begin to play those games and this is all what i'm calling the spatial um the, the schema of storytelling and i did this in i am a man very experimentally. Um, think of these as toggles on and off. Each of the scenes that I have in I Am A Man, I did alternative scenes where I said, okay, if I want to challenge and, and target the idea of concern and anger, doing it one way, doing it versus the other way, and began to, to really play this game, if you will, creating a set of rules that enabled me to further go into the storytelling as I began to analyze what are the components that drive this spatial component to drive a certain emotion. Um, so, in the and story, them as though they are not men, that's a racist right. point of view. Um, and no matter how you dress it up in terms of whether or not a union can organize it. For the sake of time, I'll kind of skip over the whole play. You start off really as a sanitation worker asking you to do the labor, if you will. Some people have commented that um, just starting the experience and having to pick up the trash can and dump it into the truck um, began to allow them to be reflective of doing this for um, days and months and years on end without breaks, without um, having vacation, without having leave. And I think that was some of the, the, the major issues that were drove to the actual strike was that these men were working um, hours and pulling off labor and weren't getting fair wages at all. And so what better way than to stand up for your rights than to go on strike? I think people will change their minds. And if you look at the historical, um, the notes on what happened at the experience, when your trash piles up, I think people really start to pay attention. I know I would, um, but that's what they were able to do to take their stand. I will acknowledge that in thinking about this VR piece, um, the challenges of looking at this in its full glory with can controllers that enabled you to pick up trash and to do what we call um, picking up objects that we think of these as evocative objects, some of that's lost when you turn it into a 360 experience. But maybe in the Q&A, we could talk a little bit more about the difference between a 360 VR experience and I'm a man versus the one like this that gives you full agency. Nonetheless, because this was designed with the controllers to pick up things, it was really important for me to kind of see through every scene these virtual artifacts, picking up newspapers, picking up signs, picking up different things, the trash, to kind of drive you to kind of build a new memory for you of this experience. And the, the, the iconic scene of the men walking by the, the, the street with I'm a, I'm a man, um, these are these, for me, the special moments in the story arc um, because a lot of people are familiar with the photograph. And unless you were there and lived it, it's like a moment missed in time. But just using a variety of techniques, beginning to put you in this space, really began to bring the story to life in an interesting way, weaving it with actual video footage. And what that video didn't show you was behind your back, a television show, um, store showing you the actual archival footage on, on the television. So there's a, a lot of games that I was trying to play in, in this project in which I was going between uh, seeing things as they were recreated, seeing things as they were, seeing the newspaper clip, living it out, and just kind of dancing back and forth to give you this, this cadence through this whole VR experience. 
responses on a piece like this, because VR is new, I, I, I chuckled at some of them. You know, some of them actually made me angry if I had to tell, tell you the truth. You know, the first time I read a negative review, um, and I wouldn't even call it a negative review, I would call it a, a, a reading of the project that was not intended. And I put here a liberal agenda to promote racism, to exasperate uh, this history of Blacks in America. That, that's an actual review of this experience on the Oculus store where it lives today. It's easy sometimes, you know, for me, this was the first time doing a project like this and making it public this way. My gut reaction was just to really be angry and say, wait a second, this is not what I was trying to do. How could you dare say that? But then when I talked to colleagues about this, they helped me put it in perspective. And they said, the fact that someone took the time to write a review like that shows that at the end of the day, it is an emotionally moving piece. And in, in this way, it just provoked them. And it says more about them than it does about your piece or even you as a designer. And so you look at all these other reviews, a poignant experience that puts history into your hands and the fight for justice in your heart. What I discovered is that VR, whether you, you, the experience moved you to tears, which I actually saw, or whether it angered you, there's something about that experience that targets you on an emotional level um, in a way that's powerful and deep, and it cuts to your soul. And that's really worth for us to explore a lot more. Um, I did have an exciting opportunity to work with the National Civil Rights Museum through the whole project, which I was able to bring my students in and begin to ask questions about, well, how would we actually put a physical VR experience in a museum? How do we, what's the juxtaposition between artifacts in a museum with a virtual project? And my students took a semester kind of just as a graphic design studio, just kind of looking at what is this, what's the spatial language of installing VR in a historical space like a museum. And we learned a lot through that, that process, even small things that are really big when you talk about installing VR, small things like the circulation and the flow and sanitation, which we are all dealing with now during COVID. But these are all great questions as designers have to ask when we talk about using VR in a public space. But at the end of the day, one of my conclusions is that VR in itself, once again, talking about it as a tool, shouldn't be thought of as the one solution for everything. And I think it's a complementary element. I think if you're going to use VR, you should think about, well, what else goes with that VR experience? Does a book go with it? Does a website go with it? In this case, does an exhibit go with it? I think we shouldn't try to solve all of the storytelling just in the headset. And I think there are opportunities to make sure that outside of the headset, there's as much complementary activities that happen that happen within the headset. And that's where we begin to really see the, the growth and the use of VR. We took this project to the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination in Memphis and put up a pop-up exhibit. It was really great to talk to local um, people in Memphis and just hear their expressions and hear their thoughts about, um, in some case, the gentlemen on the right were children. They remember seeing those men march down the street. And it was just great to see the, the natural response from people on the project just there. Um, but beyond that, there was an unexpected use of it. And this is something that I, was not in my radar at all. And it was this, it caught me off guard the first time I got the email from an organization that said, hey, we want to use I'm a man in a project used to, for police and community members to have a conversation. And I was very thrown off. I said, well, okay, let's go for it. And this unexpected appropriation of the technology was, I was approached by uh, Dr. Alexandra Ivanovich from Equality Labs. And she began to set up this program called Trading Places in which police officers were going through I'm a man and community members were going through a piece called Dispatch. And Dispatch is created by a group called Here Be Dragons and it's a beautiful abstract, using an abstract language, takes you through uh, an experience of what it's like to be called from a 911 call. And what happened when we began to allow people to take a pause to look through the lens of each other's eyes, police officers being reflective about systemic racism in communities, community members going through dispatch and really seeing some of the danger and peril that officers go through when they're called from 911. What happens is from, from the police perspective, this is a great exercise to create a pathway of trust. Because part of the problems that we have when we have these conflicts in our communities is that we're not pausing 
to listen to the other side. We're not pausing to take a moment and have an empathetic view to see, well, what's going on through their, their eyes, what's going on through their ears. And so this was a great exercise to bring the officers out to truly be reflective. And at the end of the day, this is still a pilot project. Um, we're, I'm working with other organizations that are doing similar things, but we're all converging on this idea that VR could really be this powerful tool to uh, make people pause and ask what it's like to be on the other side of the narrative. For an officer, what is it like to be approached by police in the middle of the night as a black man and told, put your hands in the air? What does that feel like? And so this is a project that for me, once again, hinges on this idea that it's not everything that happens in the headset. It's what happens before, what happens in, and what happens out. And the community conversations that happen in a VR experience really hinge on just VR being the seed, the tool of this all. You have to really organize and ask yourself, are we creating the program collectively to drive us to this place for conversations, for community healing? And the jury's still out right now. We're still doing these types of experiments. But so far in these initial tests, we've seen rich conversations. I've been in these circles and seen people with tears in their eyes reflect on the VR experience and tell their own stories. And people come out the headsets ready to listen because they, for the first time in their lives, have paused and asked themselves, what is it like to be from that other person's view? This kind of leads me to my project that I'll end in their talk on tonight and hopefully jump into some engaging conversations. I'm working on a project um, called Barnstormers. And in a lot of ways, the, the, the emotional toll it takes to tell a project like I'm a man. And I've done a few others related to the civil rights too that were a lot more closed door academic, but those projects take such an emotional toll, toll that I wanted to talk about civil rights from a more upbeat perspective. And in this case, I started thinking about the Negro League Baseball. So happens that this is the 100th anniversary of Negro League Baseball. And once again, reaching out to a museum, in this case, the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City, I wanted to tell a civil rights piece that was not all consumed about the struggle, not all consumed about the toil. And those stories are important, but I wanted to talk about triumph and I wanted to talk about um, just black excellence and men being champions and men being excellent in the face of opposition. And what better story is baseball than to tell this story? You know, times where people like Satchel Paige, arguably one of the greatest pitchers to ever live, playing the game in the midst of Jim Crow. And the Negro League is a very exciting story of not just players stepping up and playing the game that they loved and performing before crowds and people. It's also a story of healing because as the title suggests, Barnstormers, there was a moment in time when these gentlemen began to, when the game began to integrate, they formed what was called these barnstormer um, traveling teams mixed between black and white. And they traveled the South and began to show America that why are we fighting over skin color when we can come together and do great things? And baseball almost became a metaphor of just people getting along together. And it was about rooting for your champion, rooting for your city it had nothing to do with the, the skin color. And we can see even to today being reflective about sports culture today. And some of the athletes talk about this today where you root for them on the field, but we want to find a way, why can't you root for us off the field? Why can't you root for us off the basketball court? So America still has a lot of work to do here, but still once again, a beautiful picture, even with the Barnstormers project, a time when people are coming together and integrating a sport as a pathway to integrate America. And with this project, we're exploring not just the use of VR, we're exploring, like I said, a broad range of things. And the lab is looking at just XR in general. So if you have a, an avatar of a Negro League play, player, how could we bring them to life? How could we use AR? How could we use VR? We're using some of the peripherals we're creating in the Mixed Reality Lab to actually bring the user experience to life. This, this peripheral is perfect to uh, change your controllers into a device to actually play baseball. Um, once again, going through that process of analyzing photographs, we're analyzing site maps, and we're trying to rebuild and reconstruct these things as accurate as we can from the data that we have to put you in some of these historic stadiums that no longer exist to this day. 
And of course, putting you in the midst of some of the greatest players who ever played the game. These, these players um, are history makers and world changers. And a lot of them even went to war for our country in World War II and still came back to face a very segregated and still very hated culture. But they loved the game and they were heroes on the field and they heroes off the field as they dealt with facing Jim Crow World War. So this project is gonna be interesting because it has a broad appeal because it's about baseball, but I'm still not gonna escape this kind of empathetic storytelling, letting you deal with this history, not just on the field, but off the field as you tore through the South playing baseball and facing Jim Crow um, rules that were all around you. So I hopefully didn't go over for the time that we had allocated for this um, time, but. I'll stop here so we can engage with the rest of the evening with some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Derek, for that wonderful presentation. I took a lot out of it and I, I really look forward to the uh, workshop tomorrow. Um, we got a couple questions, so I'll, I'll start with the first one. Uh, be sure to put your questions into the Q&A um, as they start to come to you. Uh, the first one is from Alexander. He says, hi, my name is Alexander. I just wanted to say I love the work you do. I've been involved in a VR community for over five years. And one of my very first experiences was your project, I Am A Man. And let me just say it was mind blowing, especially the whole story and the different interactions and the experience. The question I have is, do you have any idea of when your new project, Barnstormers, may be released? And if so, will it be featured on Oculus or any other platforms? Yeah, th uh, thanks for that. I appreciate it, Alexander. Um, we're, we're targeting for next year, spring, hopefully, cross our fingers. Um, you know, if these things, things change in the pipeline, I, I have right now a small group working on it. As funding gets collected for the project, it did get the Epic Games Mega Grant Award. Excuse me. Um, and as the team grows, we can do things faster. But the interesting question about the actual headset, um, VR is an interesting space because it's hard to be a creative without thinking about the platform, right? And, and I think the, the, the only equivalent I think of about that is when a film director is really consciously thinking about, oh, this is, might be at the IMAX, right? Other than that, if you're doing traditional film, you're like, eh, I don't care what TV you're looking at. I don't care if it's on your phone or whatever. For the most part, a film is a film. <coughs> so with VR, you don't have those affordances. And when you start looking at the differences between a tethered headset to something like a computer and how powerful it can run versus a standalone headset like the Quest or um, Pico Interactives, the, the, the Pico Neo, we're looking at the, the tetherless to the computer headset it brings its whole slew of issues and problems. And so you, you have to look at this, not just as an artist, but as, as a technical problem too. Like how do we bring high fidelity to a headset that doesn't have the powerful backing of the graphic card on a PC? So because of that, and because we're plowing a way to do it that way, that does impact the timetable. So we're still keeping our fingers crossed at um, spring 2021, we could have a release, but the headsets we'll be releasing for is Oculus Quest, Quest 2, and then a couple of other standalone headsets that we're building relationships with. Uh, so I'll ask the second question. We have uh, sort of two questions in this uh, one post um, from Stephanie. Uh, and she asks, I'd like to hear your thoughts about VR technologies as a singular solo viewer experience versus emerging possibilities of networked and multi-user simultaneous VR experiences. And then the second question is, uh, do you have thoughts about the benefits versus limitations of either form of a VR experience in relation to your work and research? And then a third question. Uh, also, what are your thoughts on non-fixed VR narrative structures where user engagement determines the outcome? So I'll address the first question and a little bit the third together because they're, they're really about this idea of um, multiplayer experiences and multi-users in VR. 
And what I'll say is when you do this with the type of projects that I'm drawn to, empathy driven projects, you have to be careful in doing this because it requires buy-in. One of the things that I've noticed that, um, and I've tried several social called VR experiences, the ones once you're paired with strangers with like anybody out there, it's a wild, wild west. Like there's no governing thing to establish our behavior, our norms. We just come together and people do whatever. However, and this is, goes back to multiplayer online games. It's the ones where you have communities and people play together, like go on missions together, playing these games are the most successful and meaningful things. So unfortunately that takes time. You know, you don't play a game like Fortnite or you don't play the old school games, World of Warcraft, and go on a quest with a group of people that you don't know. Those things that you build time and over time by building those relationships, then you do things together and it's a more meaningful experience. So for me, then the question is, if you're going to address these VR projects in a way that's done that way, how do you organize and give people the time and agency to be together so that they create their own behavior and their own norms to go through the experience? And I don't have an answer for that. Um, it's, it's something that is when you do location-based VR, that's oftentimes groups of people, they know each other. You go to the void in New York and do the Star Wars experience or the Ghostbusters experience. You go as a group, you know each other, you're not paired with strangers. So that becomes an interesting question that I think would be easily done in a school system, which is a growing use of VR because their students and their teams and whether it's the university setting or undergrads, um, they know each other and they'll build those relationships. And so they'll have an established norm. So that's my, my little bit of a long answer to this idea of multiplayer. But you asked a second question. Um, uh, the limitations of VR experience in relation to your work as a research. I'll talk more about the limitations of VR <coughs> just in academia. Um, when you dedicate months of your life working on a VR experience, any VR developer will say, yes, it's like writing a book. Absolutely. It's like writing chapters in a major book or even a journal. Well, any developer will tell you the amount of hours, the amount of rigor it takes to put that piece together, it's done. The question is, does the Academy read it the same way? <laughs> And the answer is, not right now, no, they don't. And, you know, it reminds me of when I was um, doing my master's degree years ago, I'm dating myself um, in, in age here, but it was a time when, and you'd have to Google it, um, when Cornel West was in a, an argument uh, at Harvard University with the then president, Larry Summers. And the argument was about him deciding to cut an album. <laughs> And he used the roots. I remember, remember, I was like, this guy's radical. I love him. He's, he cut an album and put the stuff from his papers in an album with the roots. And he's doing spoken word. And that's how he's disseminating his information. And Larry Summers is like, oh, this is not scholarly. Like the president of the Harvard University said, like, this is not scholarly. And he was like, are you serious? Like, we need to change the paradigm. And I'm glad he did that. And I'm glad he pushed against the kind of the status quo. And that's what VR developers are doing right now. The young academics are making a choice. Oh my God, like, do I write a paper about the I'm a Man experience and write another book? Or can I use immersive technology to show the story and show this new insight? And it's early on right now. I'm happy to say that with places like USC that are now publishing games from the university and other schools that are now trying to publish media such as games and VR experiences that we're moving in a direction where the academia will respect a virtual a project and give it a call number and give it a citation the same way that you would a book or a journal. And I'll say for me, the saving grace was the Seagraph conference. They're one of the leading conferences with immersive technology. And they, when my piece was accepted and it was peer reviewed and everything, they did give it <coughs> a citation through an abstract. But it's still funny that the citation is an abstract that references the VR experience. It's not the VR experience. So we still have some a ways to go, but that's kind of my answer to like the limitations that we have in academia and the respect that we still don't have complete yet in the, the, the dedication to doing a VR piece versus doing a traditional um, paper or book.
Okay, I'll, I'll ask the next question, Derek. Uh, we have a question from Ellie that says, as artists, we want to create things to humanize people, but how can we do this without any forms of our artistic media? And I, I guess my question for that is, you say without any forms of artistic media, are, are we talking about, is this a question about COVID today? Is this about like working in isolation? I'm, I'm a little uncertain about the, um, the limitation aspect of it. Um, but when, you know, what I, what I think about that, and maybe um, Ellie can do a response in the chat or something to, to further do that. You know, the, the humanizing people in a virtual environment is an interesting thing uh, because if we're not careful, uh, all we'll do is try to create pure simulations of the physical world. There's a lot of experience. So I always tell people, as much as I show publicly, there's a volume of stuff people have never seen, like some weird stuff of just testing, like what does it mean to do this and that in VR? And that's part of the lab experience, like sharing new ideas and, and experimenting. And some of the stuff that you can do VR in VR is, is, is really scary. I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, one of the first things I did with the I'm a Man piece after I did that hotel scene, when I dealt with the assassination, the first version of it, I did it full graphic. Like you're there in the balcony. It's you see him get hit. I had simulated the blood. It fell. I said it's shock. It's gore. And it, it was horrible for me. Like even as a creator. And I tested it with a few people. They're like, this is, this is, a, I don't think we're ready for this. So this kind of like humanizing moments in people, we have to be careful about the extent of what we could do these things. And even the, the idea of like dying in VR, like people talk about Richie's plank, right? And this is idea that VR experience, you walk on the plank and you fall off. It's like, oh, you're falling. I gotta tell you the first time I did that, it terrified me. Not the walking part of it, the strange sensation of falling, even though I wasn't falling, it terrorized me. It was like weird. So we have to ask ourselves like that kind of moral responsibility of, yeah, we can do some interesting things with this media, but we, we have to take some responsibility on the, the psychological effects and stuff we might have. And uh, for those in the workshop, we'll dive deeper into that tomorrow. But that's a rich subject right now that um, we're, we're still figuring out. I see the question there. I can I can jump in some of these. This idea of where do we find some of these projects? Um, right now, pieces like I'm a Man <coughs> are listed in the Oculus Store. Um, there's two stores, a Steam Store and the Oculus Store, the two main ones where you get VR experiences. Uh, I am working with with Aaron to to showcase a 360 version of I'm a Man, which doesn't have the full interaction with hand controllers, but does give you the ability to like pan around, you could put it in a Google Cardboard or look on your computer, just to kind of see the sequence and hear the whole story. So we're working with that, and I'm sure that will be posted at a later date. Um, but traditionally, you're going to just look at an Oculus store for I'm a Man, if you have a Rift, and then look at those types of venues where, where VR is disseminated. Uh, David asks, any possibility of crossover of these projects? to browser-based builds, uh, WebGL, to reach wider public and educational audiences, uh, going I, to be some of the same issues as you get to the wireless headsets. Yeah, I love WebGL. I love WebXR. Um, for those in the workshop, we'll be doing a lot using that as a platform. It does have a lot of affordances, absolutely. Wider reach, more public. There's a lot of things you can do with that. The challenging thing is this, and this is just like as explicit as I can get. Um, people don't know the nuances between why web VR looks the way it looks and why a VR project that's on a Rift looks that way. And to be even more bold, they'll look at something on WebXR and say, well, my PlayStation and my Xbox looks way better than this. This looks horrible graphic wise. And they don't have the full understanding that yeah, running something in a browser technically is not the same thing as what you need to, to run it on experience. So for me, when I did I Am A Man, I needed to do this first project and execute it at the highest fidelity on the highest machine. 
so that people couldn't look at it and question its um, aesthetic um, value because of the constraints of the technology. And so I'm like, I will start here and then eventually maybe I'll do some things to bring it down to, to web VR. Um, so I, I say that because that's, that's always this challenge that we go through as developers asking ourselves, well, what's the end platform? And that's going to determine a lot of your decision making. I, I'm not sure we're at a point where all of these experiences can be exported that way. I love YouTube 360. I love 360 because you can still get a lot of high fidelity, but you do sacrifice a lot, you know? So it's like kind of like affordances, gain more people to see it but you lose more things and fidelity in what you get done. And it's something that we bounce off. So I weigh those pros and cons of every project. It's something to be taken into consideration. Um, but at the end of the day, that's it's really your call as a developer about what you give up and what you gain. That's a really great point. Um, that's unique once again to VR that you don't have to deal with in other forms of art. It's like, it'll get distributed the way it gets distributed. Yeah, so there's, uh, there are two questions uh, that are kind of, um, kind of make sense together. Um, one is in the Q&A by Vivian, who says that uh, your work is incredible and she can't wait to see I Am A Man as soon as possible. Uh, and her question is how you and other VR artists and creators take on the difficulty of working with technology that not everyone has access to. And then there's also a, a question in the chat by Colin where he asks, what's the best way to start creating in VR? So you're kind of- Right. So, you know, I, I would say it, it, it's an issue of scale, right? So knowing that web VR is highly accessible and that there are online tools that you could start doing that, knowing that YouTube 360 is highly accessible, you start with within, what's in your control, right? It's like, if you were a, a film creator, and you don't have full rigs and, cr and crews and everything, but you have a phone with a camera on it. Like you, you start shooting and learning how to do like small edits. And is it a full 4K camera with a full rigging system and lighting camera? Like absolutely not, but you can learn some principles of um, how to set up a scene and how to edit and how to work with music and how to put it. So VR is a, is a very same thing, right? There's different ranges of it. Yes, working in the Unreal game engine, working in Unity, those are high-end developer tools. Um, I will say that they're free tools, which is really great that the software itself to use those, as opposed to, I would say it's even easier than film. Um, uh, Adobe isn't giving free licenses of um, After Effects and Premiere. Apple is not giving free licenses of Final Cut Pro. So I will say if you have a good computer, um, game development is much more accessible than some of the other traditional design disciplines that are hinging on Adobe projects that kind of gut the consumer, even for young learners and how to get into the game. So that's one good thing. Um, but other than that, it's like you, you have to dissect the situation. So I always say, let's, let's start off with the idea of what does it mean to tell a story when you have six axes at your disposal? right front behind left right top and below that as a as a fundamental question about storytelling is something that takes mastery in time because this is the first time you're ever thinking about that usually it's like you're cropping things things in front of you you're editing this is where you look and this is the first time where i can put something here and behind me above me left and right and take into all that in consideration of the storytelling so this is it, you know it starts with some of those principles of thinking about those the degrees of freedom through which you can look and thinking about those principles and coming up with clever schemas and ways to play this and then there are simple tools where you can just mock up um, panoramic images and I, I think about um, a tool that I, I created in, in the lab called Panaform. It's a very simple tool that gives you a grid where you can draw and interact and then put them on the website and pan around and put it in a Google Cardboard. So there's always a lower floor to entry. You just can't look at a project like I'm a man and say, I want to go there really quick. You're like, no, you have to kind of start with your fundamentals of thinking about space, thinking about 360 environment and begin to like build up your, your fluency that way. I'm going to jump in here with the last question. I think we've got time for just one, one last one. Um, thank you everyone for all the amazing questions. Um, this person says, this is from KJ, 
says this is extremely broad, which this will be fun. Um, what would you say are essential components that someone needs to be successful in the design world? Hmm. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll answer, I'll answer it this way. Um, I've been thinking about the issue of trust lately. And I've been in several conversations in leadership and several conversations on what it means to build trust. And ironically, the formula for trust is, I would say, could be used to answer this question about being successful in the design world. And these three formulas that come to my mind are this idea of um, benevolence, integrity, and capability. And so let's unwrap that for a second. Benevolence, integrity, capability. Now, there are some that say that this is the formula for trust, but I'm going to use it now as a formula to being a good designer. So capability, that's clear, right? High skills, work at your craft, build the highest capability you possibly can to just be the best at your skill. Learn new skills, develop skills better. You know, I used to always tell my students about a process of doing a skill audit for yourself. Even when you're learning something like Photoshop or Illustrator, at the end of a year, you look at a tool like Photoshop and you be honest, how much of Photoshop do you know? Are there whole tool sets that you avoid? Cause you're like, I don't know what those things are, but be honest, like push yourself to, to a point where you can say, yes, I actually know everything about this tool. So that's like, that's capability, um, integrity, right? Integrity is missing in a lot of professions in the world today. We see people tricking the public, um, Facebook getting in trouble for stealing data. Like it goes on and on and on about being honest and the integrity about who you are as a person in this world and how you're using design for others. Especially with VR, integrity is really important. I personally shy away from opportunities with, with military in VR. I'm not saying it's bad. I personally shy away from it because I don't know yet how I feel about a training tool for this. I walk with police in a very kind of thin ice way. And I'm actually, um, I can't talk about that, but working with police is, a, is an interesting subject as well, but it's about integrity. Like what are you really trying to do with the VR experience in the community, what you're serving, whether you're telling, I, I have colleagues who are doing VR pro projects, um, really telling stories about indigenous cultures. And, you know, they happen to be um, Native American they themselves. I forget which tribe they're from. Um, they would kill me. But all, all the same, there's integrity in their storytelling, trying to communicate their history. And as a Black man, I get into the integrity of telling the work that I want to tell about my community. So skill building, integrity. And then let's talk about this last one, this idea of being generous, benevolence. For me, I get that out of education. And I teach and I give others. I don't try to hoard kind of like everything I know about VR. And I, ah, I figured some secret sauce. I'm not telling anyone. I think the truth behind benevolence and learning as, as any designer is sharing what you know and feeling you're a part of a broad design community. Now, this might be counterintuitive to the, the entrepreneurial side of my work, right? And where it's like, oh, you need a competitive advantage. You want to do something better than someone else. I don't think that's I think you can still share what you know and what you learn at the same time, getting new projects and getting contracts. Like it's not about hoarding these things and discovering things and not sharing. And what I love about the gaming community is they do this all the time, right? You can get on a discord server and you can go into GitHub and people share source code and people share these things. And so that idea of benevolence is not just being the designer in the room who just takes all the ideas you learn, you give back. So that's my broad answer to your broad question. Being benevolent as a designer, having integrity as a designer, and then being highly capable and building your skills. And I think those three components, you'll be successful. Well, I think you answered that quite perfectly. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, thank you so much, Derek. It was truly amazing. Thank you for um, having me. We are, so Derek is offering a workshop tomorrow from one to four. We have a couple of spots left. If you are interested, I'm going to drop my email address in the chat and uh, please contact me if you would like to attend. So that's tomorrow, Friday, uh, one to four central. 
Um, and thank you again, Derek. We look forward to the workshop tomorrow. All right. Thank you all. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Derek. Thanks. Thank you. See you tomorrow.